The Most Remarkable Theorem. Part 2 Surfaces and Surface Curvature. In Part 1, we spent a lot of time talking about curves and curvature. We described curves using vectors, and vectors given by parametric equations. We discussed the importance of the length of a vector, and how the length of a curve could be approximated by adding up the lengths of vectors along the curve. We then talked about parametrizing by arc length, and how that is a better parametrization to use, and that using the chain rule, we had this situation where we could define a unit tangent vector. That is a tangent vector of length one. We made a couple of observations about the derivative of a tangent vector being perpendicular to a curve and creating a set of reference frames for us to be able to tell how much a curve bends or the curvature of a curve, which is just really how much a curve bends away from a straight line. Now with all of that, we now take this situation to try to talk about three-dimensional curves and three-dimensional surfaces by first considering the moving frame of a three-dimensional parametric surface. So imagine our helix from last time, given by these parametric equations. We can see that the helical curve wraps around the surface of a cylinder. And as you would move along this curve, as Felix the Ant did in our last video, we can imagine Felix traveling along a moving frame, also here called the fernet serret frame. And it's three mutually perpendicular vectors that are created along the curve. And you can see that I've included the tangent plane in here to see exactly like a boxcar riding along this curve. So the fernet serret frame is a moving frame. It's a set of vectors that allows us to describe the motion along this curve. And they're unit vectors, so we can think of them as a basis for the three dimensions on the curve. So now we must ask the question, how do we construct such a frame? Okay, so the first frame basis vector that we're going to need is the tangent vector, a unit tangent vector. We say a unit tangent vector is normalized by making its length one, and we do so by dividing out by the length of that tangent vector. This also defines our first principle direction. And then next, we need another unit vector perpendicular to T. So we consider someone standing on the surface of the Earth. For them, traveling in a straight line in some velocity means moving along a direction of the tangent line. Yet they are fixed to the Earth's surface by gravity, so they will be deviating from their straight line path downwards and experiencing a force due to the curvature, given by the second derivative, acceleration. And so acceleration is moving in a straight constant line around a circle. For instance, if we parametrize a circle of radius A, Given these coordinates, we can find that the tangent vector x prime and the acceleration vector x double prime. And we can note that the acceleration vector is actually the negative of the position vector. It's in the opposite direction of the radial vector. So it's pointing inward towards the center of this circle. And thus, these two vectors remain constant and perpendicular around the curve. Now in the case of a circle of radius A, in the last video we discussed its curvature, and we defined that to be dt by ds's length, and that's 1 over A, a constant curvature, which is a way of saying that it has a constant rate of bending away from a straight line as you move around the curve. So when we define the curvature, we are defining it as the length of the unit tangent vector when parametrized by arc length. Now the normal vector parametrized by arc length, or the principal normal vector, 
can be seen here as the derivative of the tangent vector and a multiple of that unit normal vector is the curvature. And the plane that is determined by the tangent and the normal vector is known as the oscillating plane. And you can think of that plane as having a circle existing in it that is using that circle to measure the curvature of the curve at a particular point. And so if we illustrate that here with this path that is quite curvy, and we look at what's happening with the circle that we attach to it in the oscillating plane, we notice that the circle gets smaller when the curvature is great. And when the curvature is more flat, the circle opens up. And that is directly connected to the magnitude of the normal vector that's changing as we move along this curve. Therefore, the curvature of a curve is connected to the radius of the oscillating circle. Now, in order to create that third vector in that frame, we need something called a binormal vector. And from calculus, that is calc 3, you might recall that to get this vector, we are going to find a vector perpendicular to that oscillating plane by doing the cross product. And here we can also show that this will work out to be a unit vector if we're using the tangent vector t and the normal vector n. And the plane that is determined by the binormal and the normal vector is known as the normal plane. And it is perpendicular to the oscillating plane. So you can see the geometry of this moving frame taking life. Now the measure at which a planal curve moves off of a plane is known as torsion. If the vector B measures the direction at which is a curve departs from the planar curve, then the torsion is the extent to which that curve is being pulled away from the planar curve. In a sense, it's like a curvature in another direction. But really what it's measuring is how much this moving frame is twisting as it moves along the curve. And in order to calculate torsion, uh, we use the derivative of the binormal vector and then take the dot product of that with the normal vector and that leaves us with the torsion. But it is the negative of that dot product. Now let's take a look at an example from before, the helix. In the early video that we did, part one, we parametrized this by arc length. And then we found the unit tangent vector as well as its curvature being one over two A. And then from that, we can calculate a normal vector, a unit normal vector, which is the second vector in our frame. So now we have the two vectors T and N for the two basis vectors that we're going to now take the cross product of to get the binormal vector, and that'll be the third vector in our frame. So if you wanted to create a moving frame for the helix, you first have to start by the unit tangent vector and then get the normal vector and then use the cross product to create a binormal vector. Now the cross product, if you remember from Calc 3, can be found by using this determinant. And using this, we find that the binormal vector will give us a vector that when we take the negative of the dot product of that with the normal vector, we will get a constant torsion of 1 over 2a. You see it's exactly equal to what the curvature is, 1 over 2a. So for the helix being a rising circle, that makes a lot of sense. So t, n, and b form a basis for the fresnay serret frame. And this is basically the theorem that states a curve is completely determined by its curvature and torsion. Now, if we observe a, f a few things about the derivatives, then we can ask how we might calculate the derivative of the normal vector in terms of arc length. And if we notice that the cross products here, that is via the product rule, and then we substitute a few values that we already know, some things that we developed in the last video, we can get a sense of what the derivative of the normal vector is and then have the derivatives of both t, n, and b in terms of the arc length s. And this way we can talk about the moving frame completely. So we can see that we can write the derivative of n with respect to s as a linear combination of b and t and the coefficients of those having to be connected to the torsion and the curvature. 
So the Frenet moving frame in its completion can be summed up by these three differential equations. And we can actually put them into a nicer form using the matrix form of this, showing that it is a linear map from one set of basis vectors to the other. And so the moving frame is here, you see, completely determined by both the curvature and the torsion. So now, if X is a regular curve, that is, if it is all smooth and differentiable, and X is planar, it means that its torsion is zero, it's not lifting off the plane, and that the constant B is a constant vector. Now taking all of these into consideration, Carl Friedrich Gauss had the idea to parametrize a surface by mapping a two-dimensional UV plane onto a three-dimensional surface. And in this way, you can create a parametrization of a surface in the same way that you can parametrize a curve. And so you start to see that the tangent vectors in this particular way which live on a tangent plane sitting atop of the curve at a certain point, excuse me, sitting atop the surface at a certain point, can be defined by the partial derivatives dx du and dx dv. And those are the two basis vectors that form a tangent plane. They determine the tangent plane. So we'll talk about that concept a little bit more throughout this video. So if you have a surface at a particular point, and it's a regular surface, you can define a tangent plane at a particular point. And later on, we're going to see that there's some sort of calculation here with the inner product, the dot product of vectors on this tangent plane that allow us to make measurements in a very unique way, in an intrinsic way. But so far, everything that we've done is an extrinsic geometry using vectors in three dimensions to define things. Now, I just want to make mention that we can only define normal vectors on a surface if a surface S is orientable. In fact, those two things go hand in hand, and the word orientation just simply means we can define an inward and an outward direction on a surface. For example, a Mobius strip really is a one-sided surface, and so it's hard to define outward and inward for the Mobius strip. Now, in calculus, we can define a surface curve explicitly or implicitly. Z equals a function of X and Y is explicitly, where capital F of X, Y, Z equals zero is a way of describing an implicit surface. In this here, we have an example of a sphere of radius A being described by X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals A squared. And in general, if we wanted to talk about the equation of a plane, AX plus BY plus CZ plus D equals zero would be an implicit way of defining that surface. And there are vector ways of defining that surface by taking a vector perpendicular to that surface and creating a vector equation. So in the case of implicit surfaces, by parametrizing x, y, and z as functions of u and v, what we're doing is creating a mapping from the two-dimensional plane onto a three-dimensional surface. And so there's a coordinate patch around that two-dimensional domain that is getting mapped over to the three-dimensional surface. So the sort of correspondence here between curves and surfaces can be seen. In curves, we're mapping the real number line and interval to the three dimensions, where in a surface, we're mapping a coordinate patch to the three-dimensional surface. And we're doing this by utilizing the derivatives of the, the, well, the tangent vectors, I should say, that live in the tangent plane because it is the cross product of those that can define a normal vector sticking out of the plane. And if you have a normal vector sticking out of the plane perpendicular to it, you can define a plane on that equation. So here we have an implicit function. And if we wanted to show, we can show here that in fact the gradient del f is actually the normal vector in this implicit differentiation. So if you go through the details to find the equation of the tangent plane, you can use the del f, which is given implicitly, to give you that normal vector. 
So here's a surface, and if I place a point on that surface and define a tangent plane by starting to take, a, so say, a random vector in a particular direction, and we create a tangent plane, we can then slice that plane with that perpendicular plane, and we create something called a normal section. It's like intersecting the surface with a curve. And along that curve, we can measure a curvature. In fact, we do that in the two principal directions here. So it's like having perpendicular planes, three of them intersecting, and the two curves that are perpendicular to the tangent plane define the normal sections and the normal curvatures along those curves. So what Gauss realized is that you can take the idea of curves and use them for ideas and surfaces. So for instance, if we take the surface of a cylinder, it's got two principal directions here defined by V1 and V2. And if we slice it, we get a normal section. Let's say we sliced it on a diagonal at a given random vector V. That vector V is a linear combination of V1 and V2. And therefore, we can use it to describe principal directions and principal curvatures. So we have a principal curvature of one over A in the circular direction, where if we walked along the other principal direction, it would seem flat to us, a curvature of zero. And this brings us to an idea of surface curvature called Gaussian curvature. It's the product of the two principal curvatures along the different principal directions. And so for a cylinder, that would be 1 over a times 0, which gives us a Gaussian curvature of 0. And that basically tells us that the surface, locally anyway, is flat, just like a plane. But we know that a particular cylinder is globally different than a plane. And here, a sphere has a curvature of 1 over a in both principal directions. And so the Gaussian curvature would be the product 1 over a squared. You can also define something called the mean curvature of a surface by adding the two principal curvatures and dividing by two. So what is so remarkable about these discoveries that Gauss made? What was Gauss's epiphany with all of this? Well, that you'll just have to wait for part three. You see, the good stuff happens there. We tie everything together in the Theorema Egregium, the more remarkable theorem. I hope you'll stay tuned. Thanks for watching. And please hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell for more videos.